Greetings everyone. As always, I would like to start with a brief disclaimer. These videos are meant to help people learn physics. At times, it's meant to provide helpful hints. And at other times, it's meant to take you through the entire problem with hopefully what is a decent explanation so you can solve many others on your own. I try my best not to show the entire answer in any one screen so that the video remains about learning how to solve the problem and is not something simple that can be used as a shortcut to cheat or get ahead. If you're putting up with the sound of my voice, clearly you must want to learn this material. Okay, let's get started. Okay, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's look at a problem that deals with linear momentum and impulse. Um, if that's not obvious, you should always start with what you know best. So let's say you, you're working on this problem. I certainly was, and I struggled with it. And you should try to think which concepts apply, uh, what information has been given, and what do you know about those concepts regarding the information that has been provided to you. So starting with this one, we have been giving the force, oops, wrong marker. Okay, here we go. So here we have the force uh, mapped to time. So force mapped to time is actually um, in physics known as impulse. But in case you don't remember impulse or in case before solving this problem, you want to refresh, let's do that really quickly right now. So here's what we need to know about impulse. First of all, Newton's second law of motion is simple. We have, let's pick a different one, force is equal to mass times acceleration, or the sum of all forces is equal to mass times acceleration in that dimension. Um, if I'm losing you at this point, I would recommend watching a different video that covers the basic of why force equals mass times acceleration. But if you can keep up, let's carry on. So because force equals mass times acceleration, from that, um, you know, somebody went on to, I imagine Newton, went on to say, well, acceleration is just change in velocity over time. So I can write the same thing as mass multiplied by change in velocity over time. And at this point, you know, there's something, a recurring pattern he was noticing, which he defined as momentum, linear momentum. And that's how uh, physics professors or teachers all over the world teach it. So what he decided to say was, I'm going to take this m into change in velocity, and he gave it a symbol, a uh, vector. So he chose to define it. Newton, I imagine, chose to define linear momentum equation as simply mass time velocity. So if you substitute that, if you substitute mass times change in velocity with the symbol p with a vector arrow on top, then you end up with, well, force which equals mass times acceleration force which equals mass time acceleration now equals uh, change in momentum divided by time. And you know, this all, it's, it's, it's the same equation, it started simple, force equals mass times acceleration, substituted change in velocity over time for acceleration, combined m and v to give them a new symbol, substituted the new symbol, substituted the new symbol back into the equation and ended up with something that looked a little different. Now, what's wonderful about math is you do this enough times, basically, based on what's given to you, you can solve an amazing number of scenarios. So that's what we're going to do this. And that's what we're going to do here. And if you look, um, just another way of writing the same equation is like this, just uh, multiply both sides by T and uh, this side has only left with momentum or change in momentum, this is important, change in momentum. And this side is left with uh, sum of all forces times time. So now let's go back to Let's go back to our graph, right? So we've been given this problem and they're graphing force times force and time. Now, if you take the area under this graph, oops, uh, let me center that. If you take the area under this graph, for, for you to have that, you will be really multiplying force by time. And if you're doing that, then, hey, force times time is actually change in linear momentum. So. So you know something a little extra. So you thought about, well, they're doing force and time. Before I even get into it, what do I know about force and time? And you said to yourself, well, I know that, let's, let's do this over here. I know that force multiplied by time 
is equal to change in momentum. You know that, and that's great. And you also know that momentum itself is equals to uh, mass times ve velocity, right? And I'm, I might be missing a few vector arrows here, but don't mind that. So now let's start attacking the problem. The first thing I always do is check what I'm being asked, throw up everything I know about what I'm being asked onto paper, and then proceed. So now I look at this problem and I'm told the mass of a tennis ball. So I know the mass of a tennis ball and it was struck. So here's where my racket comes in contact with the tennis ball. This is my sweet spot and I'm hitting through the ball, following through as is good practice in any sport. And this is the ball leaving my racket, right? So during the time that the ball came in contact with my racket, I pushed through the ball and I let go of the ball with my racket, a certain amount of uh, change in linear momentum took place. It was coming towards me, that was its momentum, and now it's going the other way. That's its new momentum, right? You apply a force to change an object's momentum. That's what somebody did. So the question, the first question is, the total impulse for the ball. Now what is impulse? We just, you know, thought about it even before we began the problem. Hey, impulse is simply force times time, which is the change in momentum. That That is impulse. And we, all, we already said that the area under this graph is impulse. So all we need to do is subjectively count these squares. There's no objective way of doing it that I know. If somebody out there watching this video knows an objective way to calculate the area for a bell curve, please let me know. So here we are. Uh, let me get rid of the sum of the clutter that I added here. Okay, it's all clean. Um, there's one, two, three, four, five. So it spans across five squares in the x-direction and it spans across one, two, three, four, five squares in the y direction. But how many complete squares are there? Well, what's what's the area of one square? Like this is, this is 0 0.01 divided by five. That's one side. And the area of this side is just 100 and 150, 200, so uh, 50. So 50 Newtons multiplied by 0 0.01 divided into five second blocks. So this right here, this is my time, this is my force, and this is just one square, remember. I've just found one square, I haven't found all of them. So how many are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe if I put in this and this together with this and this, I get eight and nine. And if I look at this, 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 maybe that can make a 10. All right, so I'm going to say I have 10 such squares. So now I have the total area, everything. Uh, well, subjective, it's not exactly accurate. So I have 10 squares of this area, which pretty much is, in reality, force times time. So that's the area, and the area is the impulse. So that's how we answer part A. And if you do the math for that, you get, uh, let's see, let's do something clever here. I'm gonna pop over up, open a calculator for myself. 10 times 50 times point uh, what was it? Let's see, let's see. It was point zero. oops, let's start over. 10 times 0 0.01 times 50 divided by 5. And it's just 1. And the units for linear momentum are meant to be newtons times seconds, I believe. Uh, am I right? I hope I'm right. Well, um, moving on. I'm sure you guys will figure it out. So, uh, sorry, I, some of the stuff I meant to hide showed up. Let me get rid of that. Okay, so here you are. Uh, back to the problem at hand. So now you've solved for A, right? Um, now let's, now let's look at part B. What's the velocity of the ball? Now, you know, the only formula here that can solve for, for velocity is this one. So for part B, you could just say, oh, well, um, I know I have one. Well, I really hope I have these symbols right. Uh, yeah, I do. Force times times, Newton times, yeah. So that means P is equal to mass times velocity, right? And uh, we don't know velocity, but we know the mass 0 0.060 kilograms. And uh, so, just, you know, these two are the same, right? 
So velocity must equal just divide 1 newtons times second by 0 0.060 kilogram and end up with meters per second. So let's see if we can do that. Um, let's see, let's see, meters per second. 1 divided by 0 0.060, 16 0.7 if I round it off meters per second and you know if you if you guess the squares more accurately and you said there were 10.25 squares your answer of velocity will be a little bigger or if you said there were 12 squares again your answer for velocity will be bigger because your uh, change in linear momentum will be bigger but now you know how to solve this problem and no matter how many squares somebody throws at you hopefully you can do well all right thanks for watching